Welcome everybody. My name is Sally Stockwell and I'm a wildlife ecologist with Maine Audubon. I'm here today with several colleagues to walk you through how to fill out the detailed habitat assessment form for forestry for Maine birds. This is a form that's designed for professional foresters to use and we also have a, some forestry students that are interested in using it as a way to augment other information you're collecting about the forest from the bird's perspective. And so uh, first I'd like to introduce my colleagues, Amanda Mahaffey from the Forest Stewards Guild and Andy Schultz from the Maine Forest Service. And then we have our budding forester, Maddie, who is also with us today. So the first thing that I'm going to walk through the different components of the habitat assessment form and Amanda and Andy are going to tell us what we see and what we should be marking down on the form. So the first thing Amanda and Andy that we need to figure out is what the Forest Habitat Association is and our major choices are northern hardwoods, northern mixed woods, northern softwoods, and oak pine. When we're filling out this form, what we try to think of is kind of in a big circle of a stand that is more or less homogeneous, then look around what a visual acre is and what do we see within that visual acre. That's what we're going to be recording. So you can't just look in one direction. You have to spin around and look in 360 degrees to get a really good representation of what we're seeing. And the idea behind these habitat assessments is that you do different habitat assessments in different stands to get an idea of the variability across a property and to get an idea of what different kinds of birds might be seen in those different kinds of stands. So when we start our stand assessment, uh, there are a few important items at the top. First of all is the landowner. Who's a landowner here, Andy? I believe it's the town of Falmouth. Nice, good to know. And sure. what is today's date? October 23rd. Exactly, 2020. 2020. We're still here. <laughs> the year that just won't quit. Yeah. Who's the forester here, Andy? That's a really good question. <laughs> um, it's, it's neither you nor I. Or it's both of us. me, or it's both of us. <laughs> All right. No, I should mention, we should mention that uh, the town of Falmouth has worked with uh, Paul Larrabee. Um, and uh, to, to manage other parts. This particular area has not been harvested recently, but they do do some ac active management. Um, and of course, they're very, very uh, concerned or, uh, you know, wildlife habitat is a big piece for, for the town owned land. Yeah, that is significant. And then uh, the weather today, uh, overcast, 50s, light breeze, yeah. Yeah. Perfect weather. Yeah. Perfect for taking some stand data. And it's important to record this information because when you come back to your notebook later and you wonder, where was I? What was I doing? Who was I with? Then you'll have that information written down. So it's always important to start your stand assessment with some basic information. Now, more location info. Uh, we have a stand ID. So we don't actually have a stand map for this particular parcel, so we might you know, we might call this stand one. Works for me. And within that stand, we need to identify what plot we're doing. I would call it plot one. Sounds good. Agreed. So how many plots might we want to do in a stand? Well, it depends. Now really, uh, as I mentioned, a lot of times you might be doing this as part of a, a timber inventory where you Either you're looking for a certain uh, percentage of, uh, of um, coverage, and you might take a plot on a grid of, uh, say, 10 chains, every 10 chains, and then set over 10 chains. I like to throw chains in there. I don't know if anybody still uses chains. Is that still a thing? Okay, good. Uh, but actually, a lot depends on how much information the landowner wants. Is the landowner just actually requesting this or interested in it? Um, so a lot also depends on the variability of the stand. If you find that really you're coming up with the same answers in a lot of spots, 
there's no need to keep adding data. Uh, you, you can you can make your your sort of draw your conclusions. Um, better to look at the overall STAM map and say, well, we have maybe two or three very different areas. Make sure you get a couple or three in each one so you have some averaging. So however you decide to do your forestry inventory, when you're doing a foresters for the birds inventory or forestry for main birds inventory, it's probably good to do at least one plot per stand and be prepared so that you get a good picture. Again, when you kind of average your data and average what you're seeing, then you have a good picture overall of what is going on in that forest. Of course, when you start to draw stand lines, this becomes the, the art and science of forestry. And it gets back to that lumper splitter thing. So back to our habitat association. What do you think we've got here? We definitely have oak trees. We definitely have pine trees. And those seem to be our dominant species here. Would you agree? I concur. So at least from a forest habitat association, I think we're probably looking at oak pine rather than one of the other forest habitat association types. Which is a fairly common type in this part of the state also, it's the southern part of the state. And then uh, you can break that down into four subcategories. And those four subcategories would be northern red oak, red oak mixed hardwood, red oak, white pine, red maple, white pine, hemlock, and hemlock oak pine. Which of those would you say this is and why? So having walked around the, the acre and being a little bit numerically inclined. I know that's roughly 209 by 209 square. You know the radius right offhand? No, doesn't matter. And it's the visual acre. You don't actually have to go out and step it off. But the point is, I did do some walking around. And I think that we are looking at a lot of, I think we're looking at the red oak, white pine, red maple Okay. as the sub association. I agree. I think especially as we're looking at our overstory species that kind of define the stand. We are looking at a lot of red oak and mm -hmm. we have white pine up there and some red maple. Yeah. It's a different story in the understory, but we'll get there. We'll get to that. All right. So the great thing about this form is that it makes it really easy just to circle the answer, which I've done. So now we're going to move on to stand structure class. And this, uh, we have three major categories, young, intermediate, and older. And different birds cue into these different age stands. So we wanna try to get a good sense of what we have here. And um, so from just the young, intermediate, and older, what would you say we're looking at? Definitely the, intermediate. Yeah, no question. And then under intermediate, there are two choices. There's the intermediate single-aged and there's the intermediate two-aged. So in other words, are we just seeing one layer? Are all the trees more or less the same size and height or are we seeing two different layers? And we look at, you wanna look around, again, spin around, look in all different directions. Yeah. And what would you say is the dominant? I, I'm gonna say that there's really two distinct age classes here. I think we will find that we, we're going to have some canopy cover in different layers, but basically there's an overstory and there's an understory here. And that's fairly typical also of uh, a lot of the stands in this part of the state um, and, and really across the whole state where, you know, uh, something started from old field succession probably or agricultural abandonment and that's become you know 50 60 70 80 years ago maybe a little bit more and that's our overstory it's still not really old forest yet and in the meantime a uh, regeneration layer has started and we see that around this year so that's the kind of the second general age class and even though there's some small trees they're not really probably a different age i mean smallish saplings they're not a different age they're probably as old as the overstory, they're just suppressed. And, and so from a technical standpoint, our description of the intermediate two age is at least five to 10 inch diameter breast height, 30 to 70% overstory cover. And then this also suggests that there is a midstory cover over 30%, which we don't really have here, but we have the 
understory that's over 30 percent so that yeah to get a little technical i think part of that distinction that we had um i think when we were putting the form together had to do with softwood stands that have been harvested in a certain way yes. um, so that was intended to capture it but from the general description this is definitely an intermediate aged forest uh and it definitely we, we're feeling confident we see two age classes here so even if our exact numbers don't match it to a T, I feel that from a forest, from the forest perspective, that's what we have going on here. Would the birds agree? The birds would agree. Right, and part of this is trying to see the forest as bird would see it, not necessarily as the way I was trained as a forester to see it in terms of, of timber product, uh, timber value, and to sort of translate between those two things. So just to point out that like every form and every sort of attempt to put everything into a box, it's not, the, the real world isn't gonna fit it exactly. We definitely agree that we're in an intermediate age and yet we've got, we do have some trees well above 10 inch DBH and this is indicating a five to 10 inch DBH. Um, in fact, most of the overstory trees, I'm gonna say, are greater than 10 inches at DBH, a few fives and then our other age class, the, reach, the understory, which you know we'll get to measuring that in a different way, but nothing there is five inches yet. So it's a little, little different than what's on here, but nonetheless, I think we'd all agree it's an intermediate age. And even in an intermediate age forest, you might have a few remnant trees that are fit into that older category, or a number that fit into the younger category. So it, there can be variation, but what we're looking at is overall what's the the age and the class and the stand structure. So now this second page of the form, page we're going to be looking at the overstory, which is everything that is over 30 feet high. The midstory, which is everything that is between six feet and 30 feet high. The understory, which is from one feet, one foot to six feet high. And then also the ground cover, which is under one foot strictly looking at woody vegetation in this case. So we're gonna start with the overstory, which is over 30 feet, and we're gonna look at what are the dominant species in that overstory. Looking above 30 feet, I see a lot of red oak. I see a lot of white pine. So those are two species we could write down, Sally. All right, red oak and white pine. Andy, are you seeing any other dominant species we should take note of? Uh, there is a little bit of red maple that is dominant. In the overstory? Or co-dominant. Co-dominant in the overstory, above 30 feet. Sounds good. Let's put it, let's write it down. Red maple. Okay. And for that layer, would you say the uh, cover is very low, less than 5% cover? low at five to 30 percent cover medium at 30 to 70 percent cover or high over 70 percent cover and that by cover we mean as you're looking up through the trees how much of the sky is blocked out by the the vegetation so the vast majority of it is 70 percent or greater so i would give it very high we did discover one gap though which we'll get to in a minute I think it's important to remember that right now we're in late October and so some of the leaves have fallen off of the trees here. So we have to use our imaginations and imagine the leaves on the living trees as being leafed out when we're thinking about that overstory canopy cover. Yes, I might I'm, disagree I'm... a little bit with Andy. I could go with uh, with medium, um, but Andy is saying hi. I'm not going to argue with him there. I could. I think as we look around and look up and look down in the overstory in particular, I could agree with high. That's the tricky thing about doing this assessment. Luckily, um, well, we won't maybe do it today, but we could take, we could do several more of these and come up with an average. Yes, that's, that is the ideal thing to do, is to do the same habitat assessment at multiple sites and then kind of come to some consensus of what you have. Okay, and then in terms of composition, we're going to look at we're looking at what's the proportion of hardwood species to softwood species, and are the dominant hardwood? Is it mixed? 
hardwood softwood or mixed softwood hardwood or dominant softwood. So Andy? So the way I would approach prism. that is to get out my prism and take a prism plot. I'm going to make this little pine tree my plot center. And I'm going to spin it around. And basically Boy, it's close. It's about 170 square feet and it's 90 in the hardwood and 70 in the softwood. So it's very close to an evenly mixed stand, but with that slight edge to a hardwood. So it would be an HS uh, as far as that goes. Uh, that might be another thing that uh, taking a few other plots, it may push the balance one way or the other. But And at the overstory level, these are all trees Almost every tree that I tallied is in the overstory at 30, or greater than 30 feet. So for that... Well, that's good because that's what we're looking at right now. Right, for that piece. Um, and what would you say the canopy height is? We need to look up for that. Yeah. So our choices are 30 to 60 feet or greater than 60 feet in terms of canopy height for the overstory. Yeah. I'll, I'll go with over 60 plenty of pine to pull that average up and even a lot of the oak I think is greater than 60. Now that's you not agree, 60. Amanda? I agree. Okay. I just want to say I, that's not. Sometimes when we're doing these assessments people disagree a little bit and that's okay. We, we talk through it and we come to a, an agreement. Okay so over 60 for canopy height. Now we need to look around in this visual acre again and determine whether or not we see any canopy gaps because these canopy gaps are places where birds like eastern wood peewees or uh, other flycatchers will perch on the side of the canopy and then fly out into the open and feed on insects that are flying around in that canopy. All right, now we're moving on to the mid-story layer, which is six to 30 feet high. And the first thing we need to record, which is just the same for the overstory, are the dominant species. So Andy, Amanda, what do we have here? Uh, hemlock, fir, beech, talking that mid-story. So that's six feet, a little taller than I am, up to 30, which is a 30, uh, sorry, a three-story building you're looking in that sort of range um, and it is a little different than those overstory species. Right, we definitely didn't have beech and we didn't have balsam fir in that overstory before. Or, or really hemlock in, right here but they are present and um, it's both a combination of really understory trees that have grown above six feet so they're into the midstory and uh, some of the beech is actually in the overstory but the lower branches which persist with leaves so from a bird standpoint that's cover in that six to thirty range. I guess I would add that uh, red maple um, which doesn't have its leaves on right now is not contributing to the midstory significantly whereas the uh, the beach is so I wouldn't count red maple in our midstory as, as a dominant species. And then in terms of cover, are we looking at very low, less than 5%, low, 5 to 30%, medium, 30 to 70%, or high, over 70%? Yeah, having walked around the acre, um, the spot we're in now probably has the most of anywhere. And even here, I would, I would call it low, um, less than 30%, right? Yes. Right. And from what I've seen in the rest of it, it's even lower. I wouldn't say it's less than five, so I would put it in that five to 30, therefore low. Well, it's just interesting when we look at our next box of canopy cover, what we're gonna do is combine that overstory with that midstory. So what we're averaging is basically high with low to very low. Um, but from a bird's perspective, uh, that still averages out to high. So in other words, between six feet and the sky essentially, we have a lot of uh, potential habitat, branches, leaves, uh, twigs that birds can use. So I'm going to go ahead and circle high for that and then we have to backtrack a little bit and go back to the question of what's the composition of the dominant composition of that mid-story. So are we looking at hardwood, 
hardwood, softwood, softwood, hardwood, or softwood. It's very close to an even mix, but I would give a little more to the hardwood. <coughs> Excuse me. Remember, it's October. We got to put some leaves back on a few trees to, to really get the, the full picture. Um, uh, the softwood understory that's growing up into that zone isn't really as much as the hardwood that is already there. Um, so we got two more layers to go. The understory between one and six feet. We might as well do that while we're here. What are the dominant species we see? So right here, we have an eastern hemlock. Um, and interestingly, that's not the only softwood species that we've been seeing in this understory. Zero to six feet. Yeah. Got uh, hemlock, got balsam fir. Yeah. I think hemlock, fir, and yeah, a bit of beech. Because there are some beech, probably stump sprouts from old not from harvesting in this spot, but you know, just from stumps. Um, didn't see any red maple down low. But there is red spruce. There is some red spruce in the stand, yes. Okay, now we're talking dominant, dominant species. Would you include the red spruce in the dominant species? I thought in one of the other plots we looked at it was, there was a fair bit of it. We might not have uh, included it in the overall species count, in the overstory, it's, no. it is here, but it's certainly not dominant. Present, okay. but not dominant. I agree. In terms of the layer cover, very low, low, medium, or high? I would go maybe medium. It's patchy, but where, where the patches are, it's pretty heavy. So overall, I would go with medium. Well, the great thing about the medium category is it's really big. It goes from 30 to 70 percent. Right. Can't go wrong. <laughs> so, <laughs> Amanda, do you have anything to add to that? The low end of medium. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And our final layer is the ground cover layer, which is less than one foot high. And, uh, Oh, Andy's got his tape out. There's a foot. So if it's less than a foot, it's very sparse, I would say. Uh, very a low low amount of cover. The species that are there would be balsam fir, a few white pine, uh, a little bit of hemlock is, is in that range or has a lower branch. And undoubtedly there's a spruce out here. There is some beech. And a couple oak seedlings, yes. In fact, white oak, which is not present really in the overstory here. At right. least not yet. So do we call it very low, less than 5%, or do we call it low, 5 to 30%? And there is this, on the form, there is that handy key that might help us uh, visualize. Looking at that, I'm tempted to say over the visible acre, which includes a couple of recreational trails, I'm tempted to say very low for ground cover. Would it be on the high side of very low? <laughs> it might be. I could accept that. <laughs> well, if it were on the high side of very low, you might actually get to the low side of low. <laughs> Should we call it low and be good? I, I, I think, you know, very low is really almost nothing. So I, I think we have more than... More than nothing. More, more than, than nothing. Almost nothing. I'd go for the low. So. You know, clearly this is a highly scientific endeavor <laughs> and we're being very precise. Sally speaks to the birds. I'm going to go with what she says. <laughs> if she says low. So just as a re so just as a recap, what we have now is a dominant overstory species of red oak, white pine, red maple with a high canopy closure with uh, hardwood, strong hardwood component, but mixed hardwood softwood, over 60 feet high, and some very small gaps. For the mid-story, the dominant species are hemlock, balsam fir, beech, so that's different than the overstory. Low, which is also quite different from the overstory. Similarly, dominant hardwood softwood, and relatively high overall canopy cover. Understory, different again, hemlock balsam fir um, beach. Actually, that's similar to the mid-story, but very patchy, 
in some cases it, we have some pretty good patches of growth in others it's very sparse so we went with a medium cover which is 30 to 70 percent pretty wide range and then for the ground cover we've got a, a lot of seedlings coming up in some places balsam fir white pine hemlock and white oak and relatively low coverage on the low side of the five to thirty percent uh, <clears throat> so as Amanda mentioned at the bottom of this first page there is this great little visual representation of what that different cover looks like and that can be really helpful when you're trying to determine this and and uh, although you know there's some back and forth about which category certain things should fall under I wouldn't worry too much about getting it exactly right for each time you fill out the form because really we want to fill out the form in multiple stands and then get an average overall. So, um, Maddie, do you have any questions or comments that you want to add at this point? Um, I guess my biggest question is like what does this all mean for the birds then? Like what are they going to prefer and like what, what do the, like, the dense areas of like the mid-story or the understory mean for the birds compared to these open spaces? So typically uh, the short answer and if you want a longer answer I encourage you to go see our other Forestry for Maine bird videos. The short answer is that the more vegetation there is in all layers the more places you have for different species of birds to nest, find food, and hide from predators. And that's what they're looking for. They're looking, they're looking for um, eight different species uses a different part of the forest and a different feature within the forest. So the more vegetation you have, the more places there are for different species and then multiple individuals of those species. All right, now we get to move on. We've finished with our live components in the forest and now we're going to move on to the dead components of the forest, which are actually really important. Let's go find some snags. So now we're moving on to the dead components of the forest, um, wood that once was live but now is dead. And the first thing we're gonna be looking at are snags or decaying trees. And the goal here is to have lots of dead standing snags because that's where woodpeckers and flying squirrels and raccoons and all kinds of animals will nest. And or den and so we want to look at the number of small snags less than nine inches the number of medium snags nine to twelve inch diameter large snags 12 to 18 inch diameter or very large snags over 18 inch diameter i just hear chickadee chickadees are cavity nesting birds so they will use smaller snags but something like a pileated woodpecker that's a much larger bird needs really big snags so Andy and Amanda, looking around, we've got this great example of this birch snag right here, but what else do we see in our visual acre? Walking around the acre, there are not many snags of any size. Uh, one of the few is right here. And what are, what are your size of categories on, whether it's... Less than nine inches, nine to 12, 12 to 18, or over 18. So he's actually going to pull out his tape and measure it up for us. And when you say less than nine inches, you're talking about the diameter, diameter breast, breast height. height. So th this one is roughly an 11. Okay, so that would be a medium size. And was there a height component to that? Has to be over six feet high. Okay, clearly over six. Yep. Right. So just the one you think in that cat in that size category? Well, there's, there's a few fur that might also be... 9 to 12, though? No, less than 9. So that's the so small... So we've got one from nine, uh, 9 to 12 and 2 or 3 in the smaller category. Mm -hmm. So that's not very many. Not typically, many. typically we like to have at least a minimum of six, and preferably including one that's um, that's large or very large. So it, it can be tricky to spot snags when you're used to counting live trees in in a typical inventory, right? You're you're looking for the live trees and you're looking for their timber value, and then to you know sort of switch gears 
like I said, that bird brain thing. And once you do it though for a while, they'll start to pop out at you. Um, but that's another reason why it's so important to either walk through the stand or at least spin in a circle and really look carefully so you can try to find those dead trees. Because you're right, they don't always pop out. This could be a good time to mention that a lot of times you could be doing this habitat assessment along with a standard timber inventory. So you've laid out a grid and you're going plot to plot and you may do this habitat assessment at the plot center where you're measuring everything else. Or you may be taking general impressions in between plots or you might have a whole separate uh, series of plots that are strictly for habitat so that you can make that mental switch and not be so you know focused on the on the live trees and when you say that you want a lot of snags that's a relative term a lot usually that just means a few more than you have right because the more the more the better the bigger the better those are the take home messages okay so this is the ecologist versus the forester who says for a lot of woodlot owners they would like a fairly large proportion of live trees <laughs> but uh, learning to appreciate the not live anymore is part of the whole forestry for Maine birds point of view. Yes, and speaking of appreciating not live trees, the other thing that is important are down woody material. So we, we have two categories of down woody material we need to take inventory of. The first is coarse woody material, and these are logs or branches that are over six inches in diameter and over four feet in length, or tiny snags that are less than six feet high. So Andy, you just measured that, what have we got there? Right, and it's only about five inches diameter at the big end, so it's not gonna count as the large or the coarse. However, it does have some length to it. I can take that to that end. So it is uh, almost 17 feet long, so that's a that's on the that's a plus plus side. Yeah, but it's it's a little on the small side. So let's get a better example of uh, what might fit that category of a large woody debris. We were just looking at a small example of woody material that was down on the ground, but now we have a much better example of what would qualify as coarse woody material. So Andy's over here, he's gonna take a measurement of this one. Remember it needs to be over six inch diameter and over four feet long. So I'm not gonna be able to actually wrap a D-tape around it. So I use the other side of the D-tape and estimate at about 16 or 17 inch. There we go, now we're so talking. So that definitely qualifies. Yep. And, and but our threshold on length was only four feet, so we definitely okay. got more than that. Clearly here. more than four feet, no need to even measure that. And if we look around um, behind Andy on the forest floor, we'll also see some other examples of this coarse woody material. And the goal here is to determine whether we have a high number, over 20 pieces, a medium number from six to 20 pieces, or a low number, less than six pieces. So just looking behind us, what what would you say we have here? I think it's low. So it's helpful if you actually really identify and count each piece yes. that you see and the, in order to determine the, the number. The low would be less than six pieces, which... From having walked around, I don't, I didn't see yep. six. Okay. And I, I don't think... I don't think we have it. So we've got a low number, and uh, Andy, you wanted to say a little something about that. That this is, that the, that's another way of noting that we don't have a really old forest here. Can you say a little more about that? Right, I mean, a, a, a forest, a, a truly old forest would have had trees that grew up, fell over, and died um, much more than what we're seeing here. So even though we have some fairly large diameter stem is certainly over 16 inches so that bodes well for the future ecological structure as some of those uh, do 
break off, die, or become cavity trees. In fact, the, this piece clearly came from, uh, was a, a one branch of a larger pine. Uh, when, this, when this one came down and broke off, it created a column of rot in that tree. So this tree, uh, this overstory pine here, has actually got a, a much higher habitat value than timber value and will continue to contribute towards that you know, at some point in the future, you'll come out here and there will be a lot of stuff in your way if you try to walk around, uh, which is That's one a indication of a, a mature forest. And a lot of those down woody, uh, woody material, that's the reason it's important for birds is because something like a roughed grouse uses that for drumming and att attracting a mate. But also you might find food uh, mixed in on that dead, dead decaying area and also things like fishers or squirrels will use those to move through the forest and they can find food underneath that woody material like uh, small mammals or amphibians, salamanders and frogs and whatnot. So we also want to look at uh, how much fine woody material we have on the forest floor and what we really like to see are piles of, of this sort of fine woody material I'm not seeing great examples here, but we, because what you really want are this fine woody material that's piled to the point where a bird could fly in there and hide from a predator and find insects that collect in that area. So looking around, our options are, do we have a high number of piles over five, a medium number, one to four, or a low number? Or what do you think, Amanda? I think we have a low number of yeah. fine woody material piles. I, I would agree. Again, there just hasn't been enough material come down yet. Um, and then our, our last category is the hardwood leaf litter. And this is important particularly for oven birds that nest on the ground. And so we need to know whether we have an adequate layer, which is over one and a half inches or an inadequate layer, which is less than one and a half inches? Um, I would say that right here, it's barely adequate. Um, this red maple certainly has given a lot of leaves, but I don't think it's quite enough for a oven bird to really uh, be at home. However, there were other parts of the stand where the leaf litter did appear adequate. So I might say adequate patchy. Would that be acceptable, Sally? That's good note, yep. And then we have just three other things we want to try to fill in. That is, have we seen any signs of invasive plants in here? And if so, what are they and how prevalent are they? What's the percent cover? Luckily, I have not. No, which is kind of remarkable for Southern Maine. <laughs> yes, yeah, as close as we, we are to developed areas. Yeah, in this stand, however, if we, when we go back over by the wetland, uh, I believe we saw some invasives the last time we were here. Uh, but for this particular stand, luckily there is not a noticeable population of invasive plants. And how about insects and disease? Any signs of that? Nothing major going on right here. Um, however, there are definitely uh, some diseases to be aware of uh, that are in the, in the general area, but nothing I don't know. What, do you see anything else, Andy? Um, the one beech tree I saw did look like it had the beech bark disease. Pretty, pretty common. Doesn't necessarily kill the tree right off, so you can still get get a lot of bird habitat value out of it, even though it has that disease. Um, where there's hemlock in this stand, and we're definitely in the hemlock woolly adelgid <laughs> zone, uh, something to look out for. Um, didn't notice any uh, on this particular spot, but it would be it would be logical to find some around here. Not a lot of ash in the stand, so not a lot of concerns about emerald ash borer right here. Um, Gypsy moth hasn't made its way here yet. We haven't had an outbreak for a while, and with the oak component though, that could be a concern in the future. Okay, and the final thing is um, whether or not there are any riparian or forested wetlands in the forest. And I don't think we had any in this particular plot, but nearby us, there are some nice little small wetlands and little swampy areas. And 
the the great thing about having those in your forest is that it brings in a whole different component of trees, plants, and then birds that key into that. So we're doing our typical inventories of standing timber and we tend to not want to go into the wetlands, uh, you know, because that's not what we're focused on, but yet how would you capture that in a habitat assessment? Would you actually make a separate go there and, and do a stand assessment in a wetland area or a forested wetland? It's, it's more just noting it on the form. So right here, uh, what we say are note if it's present in the area. Okay. And riparian habitat, which is that forested area right along a water body is particularly important because you often have some larger trees in that area. You also, um, those trees fall into the water and create structure within the, the water, but also a lot of birds will cue into that habitat. Something like a Canada warbler likes that shrubby, thick shrubby area that's right next to a wetland, for example. So it's more, um, you don't necessarily need to do the habitat assessment in the wetland, but noting its presence is really important. Well, Adds kind of, to the diversity. Right, and that's kind of that, that whole landscape piece of yes. looking at things not only on the track, but on the neighboring parcels and in the area. You know, is there a lot of prevalence of uh, wetlands or riparian uh, type habitats? Um, it, having determined that this is an intermediate stand um, with maybe a few larger trees, is that what's next door? Is there a lot of uh, the young forest around? Is there even older forest? You know, what, what's what's in that? You take it out really to 2,500 acre blocks if you can find a way to determine either using Google Earth or other methodology. Yes, and that is something that um, you can do, you can look at back in your office after you've collected these habitat assessments in a number of different stands and you can use and we have uh, some other forms as part of our guidebook for foresters for foresting for main birds that will guide you through that process well it, it may appear from from this video that it takes quite a while to do this uh, of course it takes longer when you're trying to make a video um, like many things if you do one or two of these and you get used to it you can pretty well zip through those uh, the stand assessment form in fact there is a short form version of that that is uh, included in the uh, Forestry for Maine Birds guidebook. It's on the Maine Audubon website under the resources for foresters under Forestry for Maine Birds. And you can get to the point of uh, probably doing it in just adding five or ten minutes to a, to a, a regular inventory plot.